In Psalms chapter 11, uh, I want to start out this, uh, tonight just talking about, first of all, it's the importance of the foundations, the importance of the foundations. If you look there, in verse 3 it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So you can see the importance that is being placed there on the foundations that, uh, you know, that's something that we should take heed to. You know, he's saying, hey, if the, if the foundations are destroyed, we can't do anything. And, of course, there's a lot of ways we could approach that, a lot of ways we could preach that and apply that. But tonight, I kind of want to take a little bit of a different um, approach to it and, and emphasize that word if right there, okay? Now, of course, um, you know, one way we could look at it is, you know, if the foundations of, you know, sound biblical doctrine are destroyed and so on and so forth, you know, we are going to suffer. The righteous are going to suffer. We understand that. But I want to look more, uh, more specifically at a foundation that is the word of God tonight. Because the Bible says there, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And again, not to underestimate or, or underplay the importance of the foundations. If they are destroyed, truly we are helpless. You know, if we lose our foundation, we have no footing. Everything falls apart. Uh, you know, the foundation is, is a, an essential part of any home or building, right? Uh, before you can ever put up the sticks and the drywall and the paint and all the nice things that everybody likes to look at, you have to lay that foundation. And, you know, that typically gets buried. That's something that nobody really sees. That's probably not even something you really think of. But you start thinking about it real quick when, the, when something's wrong with it. <laughs> and usually if there's something that goes wrong with the foundation, it leads to major problems. Uh, you know, when the home we're renting right now, all of a sudden this in the last month or two, just overnight, three, you know, two sets of three tiles just went whoop like that. Now we have this big hump right in the middle of the living room where the tiles are coming up. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, what's causing this, you know? And now I, every time I walk through my living room, I have to make sure I step over it. Because it's just tile and I'm me, you know? <laughs> so... If I step on it, and I have, you know, you get this loud pop, and then I look, did it crack? Okay, it did. And then there, now there's duct tape over it, right? So we got to tell the landlady, hey, you got problems with the tile. Is it the thin set? Is something wrong with it? Well, we're getting this home inspection done, you know, because we're buying the home down here. And I told the guy about it. I said, hey, what do you, do you know about why it makes tile pop up? And he just looked at me and says, usually that's a problem with the foundation. And I said, oh, I'll let her figure that out. <laughs> she can, I'm not going to be the one to tell her that, Right. But here's the thing, you think I woke up and or thought about the foundation once in that house that I'm renting? Never, you know. I, I, I never thought about what, what the, what's wrong with the foundation of this home or anything like that. But if something goes wrong with the foundation, we notice. We might not notice in the foundation itself. It might be something exterior, it might be something peripheral that is affected by a bad foundation. And the Bible's saying, and if you would, keep something in Psalm 11 and go to Revelation chapter 19, that if the foundations are destroyed, you know, what can the righteous do? Another I, a, a way to kind of look at it is, you know, the idea of an earthquake. You know, if you've ever been in, who's ever been in an earthquake? Anybody? A few people, okay. There was, one, I was in one that lasted like two seconds, maybe not even that, maybe half a second. Up here we had an aftershock years ago. I was, I was sitting in my lazy boy at night in my, my, my reclining chair, and it was in an upright position. And I was just sitting there, and everyone had gone to bed. It was quiet. And it felt like somebody just came up behind the, the chair and went, and it was so eerie that I got up and I'm looking around. That's as long as it lasted. And I'm like, is there, I mean, it was like my heart's racing. And I'm like, my, and I told my wife, did you feel that? She's like, yeah, I felt like the bed moved. So then I go outside the apartment and there's all these people standing around, look on the news. It was an aftershock. But even just that little bit of just, you know, was so unsettling, you know, no pun intended. But it, it was such a weird feeling. I can't imagine what it must be like in, in one of these ones that just go on and on and on like you, you go watch these on youtube these these earthquakes in japan and stuff like that where just the whole house is shaking and everything's falling you know if and what is, what's happening there is the foundation is is moving right the foundation of the earth the plates that are in the earth are moving they're shifting right and there's nothing you can do about it and it's not like you can just run over here and be like okay well the earthquake's over there no you're still everywhere you go the ground is shaking look if the foundations are destroyed we truly are helpless we're really at just the, the, the whim of whatever is going to come our way. <coughs> and what is, the, what is our foundation, though, as Christians? What is our foundation? Well, it's the Lord. The Lord is our foundation. And we'll get more specific here in a minute. But Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Jesus said, without me ye can do nothing. 
Look, if the foundation of Jesus Christ is removed from our lives, we can do nothing. We're helpless. And of course, Jesus, you know, is the Word, right? The Bible says in the beginning was uh, the Word was with, uh, in the beginning, uh, the Word, uh, excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You know, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who, who is the Word? It's the, it was the Word that was made flesh. The, the flesh, and the Word was what was in the beginning with God. It was God. It's Jesus. So Jesus, we can do nothing without Him. We can do nothing without the Word. Look, if the foundation of the Word of God is destroyed, we have nothing to stand on. Everything we believe and everything we practice and everything that we do as Christians is based on this book. And if we allow this to, to, to be replaced or to taken away or destroyed and corrupted in some way, you know, we're, we're basically losing our foundation. We're losing our firm footing. Look there in Revelation 19, verse 11. Keep something in Revelation, by the way, 19. We're going to come back later at this, at, towards the end of the sermon. He said, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True and in Righteousness. He doth judge and make war. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So what is our foundation today? It's Jesus. We can do nothing without him. What is our foundation today? It is the Word of God. That's our foundation. So now you can see what I'm saying, what I'm getting at when I put an emphasis on the word if in Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Here's the great thing about this foundation called the Word of God. It cannot be destroyed. You can't destroy it. You know, people have tried in the past People have tried, has set out, made a, a, you know, their life's work to try to discredit the Word of God, and it failed utterly. It's always remained. It's always been. We've always had the Word of God. You know, obviously, we haven't always had the full English version of the King James Bible, but the Word of God has existed since the beginning. We've had it. That foundation has been there. That is the Bible. Go over to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Look, the foundation that is in our life. That, that we stand upon is the Word of God, and the great thing about, about it is that it cannot be destroyed. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we have to understand that, you know, although it can't be destroyed, you know, it's still, it's how we, it, don't let that underplay how the essential it is in our life. What I'm saying is don't take it for granted. You know, don't take it for, well, I know the foundation can never be destroyed. It's always there. But you can still take it for granted. Okay. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, you're going to Isaiah 28, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a, man, a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. What is a rock? It's a foundation, right? If we hear his sayings and doeth them, right? It's not enough just to know they're there. It's not just to know, oh, there's the sayings. Yeah, I hear them. Yeah, I go to, I go to church. You know, I hear my parents. I hear the preacher. You know, I, I even read it myself. And I hear it. You know, that's not enough. That's not being founded on the rock. It's when you hear it and you do it. That's being founded upon the rock. And he says, He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, a sure foundation. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon it, on that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Now, if you're there in Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse 9. It says there, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, uh, excuse me, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And you know, that's, you say, what's that got to do with what you're talking about? Well, it's kind of like that's how you lay a foundation. You know, when someone says, hey, you've got to make this your foundation of your life, you've got to know the Word of God, that can be intimidating at first because there's a lot to know. <laughs> there's a lot to figure out. There's a lot to put in practice. But how do you lay a foundation? Do you do it overnight? No, first you've got to, you know, plot out where you're going to put it, you put up the strings, you get the machinery out, you dig it, make, get the grade stakes out, make sure everything's level. Then you bring, you know, lay the rebar down, you bring in the concrete, you finish it, right? There's a process there, right? And it's the same way in our life. We hear these sayings and we do them. And how do we, and how do, we do that? We do that line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We add to the foundation more and more as, throughout our life. We keep adding to it and we are built up in Christ. 
And what that should also tell us is that, you know, no part of God's word is insignificant. Obviously, there's a lot here. There's a, the foundation is big. It's a, it's a lot to take in and understand and know and do. And we might say, well, you know, this part's real important, but this part, not so much. You know, I'll get to that later. Well, try that with a literal foundation. Like, well, we got the concrete. You know, we, we got the crew lined up to do the backfill. We got, we got the finish guys here. It's, we're going to get in there, but, you know, we're just going to skimp on the rebar. You know, we're not going to put as much in there as the, as the engineer called for. Or we're going to use a different mix or something like that. You know, it's not, we're just some sm minor detail. Well, that could lead to, you know, a house that's, that's sagging and cracked or whatever in the future. So, yeah, the foundation is the word of God and it's line upon line, but don't take it for granted. Yeah, it's never going to be destroyed. It's always going to be there, but it can still be taken for granted. <laughs> if you would, go over to John 15. John 15, the Bible says in Psalms 119, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You're going to John 15. He said, look, thy word is settled in heaven if the foundations be destroyed. We have, we have a foundation that cannot be destroyed in the word of God tonight. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, is what Jesus said. So we know that our foundation in the word of God cannot be destroyed, but you know what it can be? is neglected. It can be neglected. Yeah, we have, and that's the almost, you know, just the mind-boggling thing in the Christian life. We say we believe this book. We say this is the word of God. It's preserved. It's inspired. It's ours. It's, it's, it's perfect. It's going to help us. But you know what? Sometimes we just neglect it. The word of God can't be destroyed, but it can be taken for granted. The word of God cannot be destroyed, but it certainly can be neglected, can it? It'd be like somebody laying a literal foundation. You know, they get, someone goes through all the work of having this just picture-perfect foundation. It's just, it's to spec. It's ready to go. And then the builders show up to start doing the framing. They're like, there's the foundation, but let's build over here. Well, the foundation's right there. What do you, what do you mean you're going to build over here? Yeah, I just don't feel like using that foundation. And a lot of Christians, that's how they live their life. They know, oh, here's the foundation, but I'm going to build my life over here. You know, and it's, 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 it's just as ridiculous. So the word of God cannot be destroyed. We have a foundation that's going to last, but that, you know, it certainly can be neglected. And here's the thing. We need that foundation in our life. We need to have this foundation because of the fact that, as the psalmist is expressing here, we live alongside wicked people. You know, we, we exist in this world with wicked people. It's just a fact. You know, the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. The Bible says in Psalm 12, the wicked walketh on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Look, the wicked, is, let me read it again. The wicked walk on every side. You're being surrounded by them when? When the vilest men are exalted. Now, are there vile men being exalted today in our world, in our country? Look, when you have a tranny being appointed by the president to high office in the land, the vilest of men are being exalted. And it's no surprise to us that the wicked are walking on every side. They're out, they're proud, they're, they're shoving it in everybody's face. The Bible rings true again. And that should only, you know, move us to understand or cause us to understand that we need the foundation even more. Look, when the wicked walk on every side, when the storm, you know, like Jesus said in Matthew 7, when the winds come and the storm blows and beats upon that house... That's when you're going to wish, oh, I, had, I wish that you'd built upon the rock and not the sand. I mean, it's really easy to build upon the sand and say, well, it's so bright and sunny out. There's no cloud. There's not a cloud in the sky. What could possibly go wrong? And then the storms roll in. Wicked men are, are, are exalted. Vile men are exalted. And then next thing you know, it's that storm that's coming. <clears throat> if you look at verse 2, I know you got you in John 15, but... In Psalms 11, verse 2, it says, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. So he's talking about the wicked. You know, what do the wicked do? They plot, right? And I'm here to tell you, if you haven't noticed already, we are surrounded by the wicked. You know, the, the wicked are getting worse and worse all the time. The Bible says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But are the righteous in authority today? Definitely not. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. You know, there's a lot of sighing in this country. A lot of righteous people, a lot of godly people just oh, are grieved by what they see going on. 
because of the fact that the wicked are bearing rule today. And that should just, you know, cause us to understand how much more we need the word of God, the foundation in our life. Because the wicked, they're there, and you know what they're doing? They're plotting. They're just like these, the wicked in Psalms chapter 11. They bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string. Why? To, to, for target practice? Because they're, you know, archers? You know, or whatever. The, you know, they want to see how, how high a score they can get? No, so that they can privily shoot at the upright in heart. You know, they have a very specific target in mind, the upright. They want to destroy God's people. And it's the same way today. They plot. They don't just plot against anybody. They plot against God's people. So we better make sure we're founded on that rock. We better make sure that our foundation standeth sure, that we have a strong foundation, a sure foundation, and not neglect it. <clears throat> because the wicked, the Bible says in Psalm 37, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. They attack. These are people that are on the offensive. You know, they are setting out to attack the, the upright and the righteous. And that's going on today. I mean, it's been going on for decades. I mean, look at the attack that they've, they've uh, you know, put on the family. You know, the family unit, the nuclear family, through, you know, things like feminism and so on and so forth, where they're just attacking the role of fathers and attacking the role of mothers and trying to break down, the, you know, the structure of the family, which is God-given. And, you know, we could talk about all the different ways that they attack tonight. You know, but I, I'm pretty sure there's nobody in the room that's, that's wondering if that's true. Probably everybody in the room tonight understands the wicked are real, the wicked are out there, they, they, are, they walk on every side, and they are attacking. They're attacking in the home, they're attacking in the schools, they're attacking, you know, through the media, trying to brainwash people, they're attacking, they're on the offensive, they're bending the bow, they're making ready the arrow upon the string so they can shoot at the upright in heart. <coughs> And, you know, people, you know, maybe that might be a shock to you tonight. But you know what? That's what Jesus said would happen. He said, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. It should never come as a shock to us that the wicked would plot against us. Look at John 15, verse 17. He said, these things I command you that ye love one another. You know, and this is kind of a sub point here, but how important that is. He's, put, he's saying, love one another, right? And why is it so important that we love one another? Because we're going to get plenty of hatred out there. There's plenty of hatred the world's going to send our way. So we might as well love one another. Because you know what? You're not really going to find anywhere else. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. He's saying, remember the word. You know, I'm trying to remind us tonight that we are hated and despised by the world. You know, they're not, they don't love the word of God. They want to destroy the word of God. They don't, they shoot at the upright in heart. They plot against the just. And here's the thing, you know, I'm not trying to discourage us. I'm not trying to make us feel down about it or think, well, what's the point of trying? You know, but it is a reality that we have to face. And look, there's plenty of people out there today that'll, that won't tell you that. Plenty of churches out there that'll they'll try to be just like the world. They don't want to be hated by the world. They want to be loved by the world, so they're not going to say anything that would offend the world. They're not going to preach the word of God. You know what, but what are they doing when they do that? All they're doing is helping you build your house, your life, upon the sand. They're not standing upon the rock. But then again, do they really need to? Because they're not going to be hated by the world. Do they re are they really going to have to face the onslaught of, you know, the storms and the, and, and, and the, the, all the, you know, the, the wicked plotting against them? No, because the, because they're not upright. They're not righteous. <clears throat> Look, the wicked are an attack. The wicked are an offense of that, but that should not, you know, get us down. In fact, this is a great psalm because it's actually quite uplifting. <laughs> you know, it starts out on kind of a down note, right? It's like, you know, if the, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Well, here's the good news. It's if the foundations be destroyed. And we have a foundation that cannot be destroyed. Amen. And if we're going to stand upon that foundation, then we're going to stand upon a rock. Right. You know, and Jesus said, you, without me, you could do nothing. Meaning, if we do, if, if, if with him, we could do everything. Now go to, you're in John, uh, where do I have you go? John 15. 
Go to Revelation 19 if you kept something there. Here's the good news tonight, is that we have that foundation. We can use it. And even beyond that, and we find in the psalm is that though the wicked plot against the just, they bend their bow, they make ready the arrow upon the string, and, and privily shoot at the upright in heart, and, they, and they're plotting, and they're working, and they're exalted, and so on and so forth. Here's the thing about it, though, is that they're going to be destroyed. They're going to be destroyed. And that's, that's a good thing when the wicked are destroyed. It's a good thing when the wicked are taken out of the land. <clears throat> you say, well, uh, what do you mean the wicked are destroyed? I thought God loves everybody. Well, if you're in Psalms, if you kept something there too, Psalms chapter 11, it says in verse 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. So upon, it's not upon the wicked he shall patiently endure with them and, you know, and, and just try to love them and try to win them to their, his side. He's going to rain snares upon them. And, it's such a, and I was thinking about that phrase, a snare is a trap. You know, talk, the Bible talks about how you know, a, a man layeth a snare for his neighbor. It's talking about, and anyone who's done any trapping or knows anything about it, that's, that's like a type of trap, right? A, a rope that would snare an animal. And it's just so interesting that God, it says there, he's going to rain snares upon them. Like we think about, okay, the fire and the brimstone, the horrible tempest, like we're used to hearing that. You know, Sodom, Gomorrah, you know, the book of Revelation, you know, he's going he's gonna to rain fire and brimstone, and he has in the past. But what about, what is it, he's going to rain snares, you know? And what, he, what I think it's saying, there's not these literal snares, but basically that when God's judgments come, when God de finally destroys the wicked with fire and brimstone, it's, it's like being caught. There's nowhere to go. You're trapped, basically. I mean, we're, they're, you know, they're going to run to the, to the rocks and the mountains and, and try, to, try to, you know, and, and cry out and say, fall upon us, you know, and hide us. The great day of his, the, the day of his wrath has come. And, but there will be no hiding place. You know, the rocks will melt with a fervent heat. I mean, he's gonna, they're going to run like wax at his presence. So it's like, that's, that's the, the imagery there, that when God begins to judge the wicked, the wicked are snared. They're like a helpless animal that God is just going to clobber. Because that's what it's like with trapping. You know, it's not, it's not a pleasant thing. I don't know why. I, I'm, I knew guys in the past, and I thought, I can see shooting. You know, I can see archery. I can see rifle you know, taking an animal that way, but <coughs> I don't know if I'd have the stomach for trapping because you'd have to catch the animal and then they're alive when you find them usually, or, you know, if, and then you have to club them. You, know, you have to bludgeon them. <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, gruesome thing, but that's what God is going to do to the wicked. They're just going to be like some, some stuck animal that can't get away, you know, and it'll, it'll throw a fit, it'll scream, it'll cry, it'll lash out, but God's just going to go thunk. That's going to be it for the wicked. <coughs> And that's the good news. You know, yeah, we understand that the world's going to hate us. Yes, we understand that they're going to persecute, that they're going to plot, that they're going to walk on every side, that they're going to bend their bow, they're going to shoot at the upright. But we know that ultimately we win because God has them snared and God is going to destroy them. So well, I don't know if he's going to do that. Well, he's going to do it in the future. The Bible says in Psalms 2, why do the heathen rage the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves together, or excuse me, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their courts from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You know, that's something that God is going to do one day. It's prophetic. Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11, I mean, talk about a book of God just raining snares and fire and brimstone upon the wicked. This hasn't happened yet. And God hasn't changed. This is who God is. And he says in verse 11 of Revelation 19, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. I mean, he's coming back to, to make war and to judge. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and not his own <laughs> and his name is called the word of god and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean now who's that that's me and you you say oh it'd be so cool in the bible guess what you are <laughs> you're right there i just read about us verse 15 and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword and with it that he should smite the nations and we know the story. Like, look at verse 19. He says, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth, 
and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on his horse and against uh, on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, which he deceived them, and received the mark of the beast that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a, a lake of fire, burning uh, with with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of the of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. So God, you know, God is going to judge the wicked. He, it, you know, this isn't just the psalmist, you know, waxing eloquent. It isn't just the the psalmist getting all fired up, you know. This isn't just good preaching. This is going to happen. This is what he's. This is you know. This is something we should get excited about. You know, because the the alternative is just go. Oh, the world's so bad. Oh, it's just so tough to be a Christian today. Oh, I'm just doing the best I can. I'm just just hanging on. The Christians live their life like that. Just this white knuckle Christianity. Just like, oh, when's Jesus going to come? I don't know how much longer I can take it. Well, maybe you should get more excited about the fact that God is going to rain snares upon the wicked. I mean, if all we see is them doing this, yeah, I get it. You know, oh, they're just, you know, I just feel like I'm constantly getting attacked. Well, you are. But the good news is, is that God is going to take vengeance on them. So, you know, I'm trying to kind of shift our focus a little bit tonight to think about what is going to happen. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, go over to Jude 1, Jude 1. Jude 1, the Bible says in Proverbs 24, fret not thyself because of evil men. That sounds like a command, <laughs> you know. Now, hey, it might be a good idea, you know, it would really cut down on your stress levels if you decided not to fret. Saying, look, don't fret. Fret not because of evil men. Neither be thou envious of the wicked. You know, we could go to tr Psalm 70, where the guy talks about how he, he you know, he, he was envious at the foolish. How they were, you know, they stood out with fatness. They don't have trouble as other men. Doesn't it just seem like wicked people get away with a lot of stuff today? Don't we just see wicked people just, seems like life's going pretty good for them. Nothing's really going wrong. Everything seems to all go their way. They all play the game. They go along. Everything seems great. It'd be easy to become envious at them, wouldn't it? Be like, well, why can't I be like that? You know, I got all these rules I got to live by. You know, I got to be a moral person, you know. You know, but the way of the transgressor is hard. And he's saying here, fret not thyself because of evil men. You know, people that just get too hung up on, you know, what the wicked are doing. You know, or, you know, spend too much time on YouTube finding out about how, you know, people are just, just so worried about what Bill Gates is going to do to us. Look, I'm sure Bill Gates is up to no good, but do you think, I, do you think Bill Gates keeps me up at night? No way. I, I'm, I'm a Mac user. I don't ever think about Bill Gates. I don't, but people, do people worry about people like Bill Gates? They fret because of evil men. You know, what's in the water? What are they doing to us? It's like you're fretting. You know, you, things that are beyond your control that you can't even control. People just sit there and bite their nails and they worry. And the Bible says, fret not. What's going to help you to not fret about evil men? To stand upon the foundation of God's word and to understand what it says, that God is going to judge them one day. Amen. That ultimately, you know, we come out on top. And God is judging, he's going to judge in the future. Say, oh, that's nice, you know, I hope that's the case. But consider the fact that God has judged in the past. You know, that should encourage us, because God has judged people in the past. I mean, we could just start to think about some of the major things we see in the Bible, right? Like, what's one? Uh, the flood, where God just kills everybody, except eight people. That's God judging the world. He's done it in the past. Yeah, but that was back then. He's, you know, okay, well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Where he literally rained fire and brimstone in the cities, you know, in, in, in roundabout in like manner. How about the Babylonian captivity? When God just takes, you know, the, the Israelites just off the face of the earth and carries them off into a strange land. You know, and not to mention all the times he judged them before that. Look, God judges wickedness in the earth constantly. And you know, and if you know, if, if you're if you're living wicked, and if you're being if you're backslidden and you're an evil person or whatever, yeah, you should probably fret. But look, if you're the righteous, if you're standing upon the rock, fret not thyself because of evil men. And don't envy the wicked. And he's going to judge in the future, and he's judged in the past. Judge Jude chapter one, verse five. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. So that's the comfort that God gives us. Not only that he saves us, but then he destroys them that believe not. 
And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after stirring flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the eternal vengeance of fire. Look, God has judged in the past, and he will judge in the future. And, and you say, well, I, well, what's that to me? That's your consolation. That should give you peace. <laughs> that should give you hope. Because, you know, if all we're thinking about the fact is that evil men are plotting, you know, then, then that would be a pretty, you know, a pretty miserable existence. Then can you really say you're, 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 you're founded upon the rock? <coughs> But God has judged in the wicked, and the wicked will be destroyed. They've been pe- destroyed the fu- they will be destroyed in the future and the past. And you know why they're going to be destroyed? You say, well, that's kind of harsh. I mean, why is God so hard on the wicked? Well, they hate God. That's why. And that's what this psalm shows us. Look at verse 5 in Psalms chapter 11. You say, boy, fire, brimstone, snares, floods. God seems a little harsh on the wicked. I mean, couldn't he just lighten up a little bit? Well, just remember this, that they hated God. Right? It says in verse 5, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So who's the, who's, who's the, whose soul are we talking about there? The Lord's. Okay? The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. He's talking about the Lord. The Lord hates. Who? The Lord hates the wicked. The Lord hates them that love violence. Isn't that... The, isn't that Aren't you glad about that? Isn't it great that God hates people that love violence? That's a, one of God's best attributes. I mean, what if God was just, you know, impartial in that regard? What if God was just completely passive, didn't have opinion? It wasn't even that he was for them. It was just that, you know, he didn't want to do anything about it. That would not be good. That would not be something, that would, that would not be admirable. I mean, think about that with a person. If somebody was just so calloused and cold to just see people, you know, committing violence on other people and just be completely indifferent, you know, like, like the Buddhists teach, just be indifferent about everything. That's a cold, calloused way of living. That's not anything to, 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 to aspire to attain. That's not good. You sh- it should bother you that, that people commit violence on other people. It should make us want to see judgment and justice be served. And the good news is that exactly, that's exactly who God is. He's a God that does judge, that does hate other people. It says he, and it's not that he hates just everybody, but he hates them that love violence. And here's the thing. It's a mutual hatred with, with the wicked and God. It's not like God's the only one doing the hating. Go to Psalms 81. They hate right back. Thou shalt not, he says in Exodus 20, you're going to Psalm 81. Thou shalt not bow down thyselves to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So are there people out there today that hate God? Yeah. And you know what? God hates them right back. It's, a, it's not like God's just a bully. It's not God just picking on them. It's like they hate God just as much as he hates them. Psalms 81, verse 10. I am the Lord, thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me, so I gave them up under their own heart's lust. So why, why did God give them up? Because they would none of him. They didn't want anything to do with God. And they walked in their own counsels. They're casting off God. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. So that, again, the Bible's showing us there's people out there that hate God. Like, well, I don't think God should hate anybody. Well, okay, but they hate him. Go to Psalms 139. Now look, there's other, you know, there's other passages we could go to. I'm just going to move through them very quickly for sake of time. <coughs> of course, in second, uh, we'll just read Psalm 139. We'll, just, we'll skip these other ones. He says in verse 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. That's a promise. <clears throat> Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. I am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. 
So we have to understand the wicked are going to be destroyed. Say, well, how do I know that's true? Because God hates them. Because God is a God that hates people. And I know that's not a popular message today, but that is the fact. And look, this needs to be preached. I know people say, oh, that's all you guys ever preach about. Look, this needs to be preached. And it's Psalm 11. I'm just going through the book. I mean, what else am I supposed to say? Ignore that verse? (laughs) You know, it's the facts. And this is an important doctrine today. You know, when a lot of people out there say, oh, God doesn't hate anyone. God loves everybody. Not true. God isn't just all love. And God isn't just all hate either. He's both. And you know, you go, well, who does God hate? God hates people that hate him. <clears throat> so that, you know, again, that, that's a promise that we have. I'm glad God hates people. I'm glad that God is going to destroy people that privily shoot at the upright. So what's the conclusion? You say, well, that's, that's great. You feel that way. But, you know, how do we apply that to our life? Well, don't flee. Don't do what the wicked want. What do they say to the upright in heart? They say, you know, flee to the mountain, right? How say to my soul, you know, uh, uh, flee like a bird to the mountain. That's what they want. In, the, in verse 1, in the Lord put I my trust. How say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. <laughs> and I love, I love the way that's phrased as a question. Like, it's, it's almost like he's saying with like, like he's offended. Like, like, who do you think you are? You know, like, how do you say to me, flee to my mountain? You stepping? You know, like. You know, step off me, basically he's saying, right? Because he's saying, look, and the Lord put I my trust. How do you even begin to say to my soul, don't you know who I'm trusting in? Don't you know who's on my side? You know, it's like that, that, uh, that cartoon or movie or whatever when there's, you know, there's the, there's the big bad wolf chasing the little puppy or whatever like that, you know, the little animal, and finally the little animal's running, he turns around, and he starts growling back. It's like this little wimpy growl. And then the, the predator runs off, and he's, oh, yeah. He's, then he turns around. What's really going on is there's like a big bear behind him that's on his side. You know what I'm saying? I remember seeing a movie like that. Like this little bear was running away from a leopard or a, or, a mountain, or a mountain lion. And then all of a sudden, the mountain lion just takes off. And the little bear's like, yeah. And he turns around, and there's a big papa bear. And he's like, he wasn't afraid of you, buddy. Right? And that's the way this is kind of with us in the psalm. In the Lord put I my trust, how you say to my soul. It's not, it's not, don't you know who I am? It's like, don't you know who God is? Don't you know who my Lord is? You know, we, we've got the Lord on our side. So how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird is to your mountain? It's, it's insulting. And here's the thing. Don't flee. Don't get, uh, you know, don't get, um, you know, down about the fact that the wicked are exalted today. Don't get down about the fact that, that, that vile men are walking on every side. That the wicked are bending their bow. Right? It's going on. We understand that. But don't let that get you down. Because God sees and God will judge. Look at verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And, you know, we, we understand that. We sometimes we're like, oh, God's so far away. You know, because his, his throne is in heaven. He's, he's in his temple. He's, he doesn't really know what's going on. Does he even notice how bad it's getting down here? Yes, he does. It says, his eyes behold, his eyes, eyelids try the children of men. Look at verse 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. And the countenance is the face, right? But it says there in verse, in verse uh, 4 that God, you know, he sees. He sees uh, his eyelids try uh, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. He sees everybody, right? The good and the bad. God sees everyone, right? But it's interesting in verse 7 that he kind of, that's ex- that part is reserved just for the righteous, right? Verse 4, the eye, uh, the, the, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men, everybody. Verse 7, it says, his countenance doth behold the upright. So yeah, God sees everybody, but at the same time, you know, having his countenance is something that's reserved for the righteous. And, I'll, you know, go over to Psalm 67. We're almost done, but Psalm 67. And I'm trying to explain what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that, you know, sometimes, you, you know, you kind of keep everybody in your peripheral. You kind of know what's going on around you all the time. If something moves over here, you kind of take note of it. Like if you're driving down the freeway, you know, you're kind of checking your mirrors, at least you should be, you know, and you're kind of, you're kind of, figuring out where everybody is in space and time, right? And kind of how you fit in the, in the flow of things. 
But you, you don't just focus in on one person, right? Right? Well, you know, sometimes we do focus in on just one person. You know, if there's somebody that we like, if there's someone that we love, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll turn to that person and give them all of our attention. You know, our countenance doth behold them. Our face actually turns to them. Because that's what the countenance is. It's, it's your face. You know, it's God looking, f- you know, full on at somebody. Look, the, God's eye, you know, he sees everything that's going on, but he doesn't just focus in on just anybody. You know, God's countenance is reserved. It beholds the upright. Okay? So hopefully this is making sense. God sees all, right? But his countenance is reserved for the upright. And that's kind of a blessing in scripture. When you, if, you, if you look up that word, the, his countenance, right? It says in ver- Numbers chapter 6, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, right? Because God is light, right? So if God is, it, you know, shines, make his fi- face to shine upon thee. What does that mean? Look, am I looking at, can you say I'm looking at you right now? Go ahead. Am I looking at you? No. Am I looking at you now? <laughs> right? The Lord make his countenance to shine upon you. Meaning, let God, let, may God look at you. May God look your way. May God's eyes be upon you. Right? That's what he's saying. That's a blessing when God's countenance shines upon you. That doesn't mean God doesn't see everybody. He does. He sees everything that's going on. But God makes his countenance to shine upon the upright. <clears throat> the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Look, it's, it's, it, the world is, is, a, is a scary place. It's a frightful place. And we can start to fret about evil men and, and, and all that if we want to. But you know what? If, you, if we would just get the, this idea in our head that God beholds the upright. And if we would live godly in Christ Jesus, and if we would you know, read our Bibles and pray and meditate upon the Word of God and serve God with our lives, we would have the peace of knowing that God's countenance is shining upon us. That God is beholding us from heaven. And what would that do? It would give us peace. Are you Psalm 67? It says, verse 1, God be merciful to, unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, go over to Psalms 82. Psalms 82. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Look, his eyelids, his eyelids behold, his eyelids try the children of men. His eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. But his countenance is reserved for the upright. And the upright need to delight themselves. And the upright need to take knowledge, acknowledge that fact and, and embrace that. And then that was what's going to give them peace in a world that's filled with wickedness. <clears throat> You're in Psalms 82. The Bible says in John 3, And this is condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. <clears throat> For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Right? They hate that which is good. They hate that which is holy. They hate that which is pure. Okay? So now can you see why the wicked would say to the upright, flee as a bird to your mountain. They don't want the righteous around to remind them of how bad they are. It's like the Christian on the job site. Everyone's like, well, don't hang out with that guy. You know, he's not going to come drink beer and t- tell dirty jokes on the weekend. You know, so we're not going to, you know, he... And it's not that, they, they, that, that there's something wrong with him. It's, just, it's that that guy, they don't like that guy because it reminds them of how bad they really are. It's like, oh, you can actually live a godly life and this guy's happy and he doesn't have the problems I have. And it just, you know, but it just makes them feel like dirt. <laughs> you know, I don't know how else to explain it. That's what the Bible says. It says there that everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. And ye are the light of the world. You know, if we're the light of the world and we're, and we're light, we're walking in the light as he is in the light, the evil are going to hate us. And they're going to say, flee as a bird to your mountain. Get out of here. I don't even want to acknowledge you. I don't even know that you exist. <clears throat> but here's the thing about that. Being told to flee is an insult to the upright. And that's what he's saying there. How say you to my soul? <laughs> you know, Who do you think you are? How do you say my soul flee as a bird to your mountain? It's an insult to be told that. <laughs> because really, when he comes down to it, the wicked are the ones trespassing, aren't they? 
They're the ones that are trespassing because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You in Psalms 82, it says in verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. You know, the wicked, they're on borrowed time. They're, 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 they're the ones that, that need to flee. They're the ones that need to go away. And they're the ones that are going to be taken out of the way, right? But who's going to get the earth? The meek, the upright, the righteous. You know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So you can see how it's kind of an insult when the wicked tell the upright, hey, flee. It's like, actually, you're standing on my property. <laughs> Hate to tell you that, but you're, you're the one who's trespassing here. It's an insult. So here's the thing. Here's what I'm getting at tonight is that if we love the Lord, you know, if we build our foundation upon the, uh, or we build our lives upon the, the foundation of God's word, the world will hate you. It's, it's a fact. All they live God, God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But here's the thing. Does that, does that mean we should just not do it then? Say, well, if that's, if that's a price you have to pay to be hated by the world, then I'm just not going to build upon this rock. I'm not going to stick out like a sore thumb. I'm not going to, I don't want to be different. I don't, want, I don't want any conflict in my life. Well, then maybe this foundation isn't for you because that is the way it works. If, you know, if they hated him, they're going to hate us also. You know, we're not, the servant is not above his master. So if we build our foundation upon the world, you know, and we love God, the world will hate us because you know, evil, the darkness despises the light. But the assurance that we have is that God sees. God sees everything. God knows what's going on, God's, and God's not indifferent. God will judge. So, the, you know, the, we need to be, what we need to do is, is to not flee today. Not flee. Do not flee to the mountain. Go, oh, the, well, the wicked told me to go, so I guess I'll just go up my mountain. And look, there's a lot of Christians doing that today. A lot of preachers backing down. The wicked are saying, hey, shut up. Quit preaching that. Quit saying that. Flee to the mountain. Get out of here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll just take my book and go home. And that's what they do. But that's not what we're going to do. We are not going to flee because they're the ones that are trespassing. Stand upon the foundation and you will not be destroyed. Let's go ahead and pray.